So let's get straight into it. Why should you read a very short introduction to typography? Typography? That's just about fonts, isn't it? What's so interesting about the subject? Let me start by suggesting you already know quite a lot about typography. You're an expert reader and you can read almost anything. If I present you with only half a line of letters, you might be surprised at how easy it is for you to read it. Of course, it matters which half of the line I show you. That's because, in English at least, there are more letters with unique, distinguishable shapes above the midline than below. So if I show you the bottom line of a similar line of type, <laughs> you may not find this quite so easy. <laughs> You're attuned to meaning in typography. You can accurately read the intentions of a designer even before you start reading. We live in a visual world and we only have the immediate impact of a document on our eyes from which to form a judgment. And we're experts at doing this, inferring meaning even when none exists. Recent research into readers' responses to different typographic and layout conventions has drawn out some of the rhetorical associations readers make when confronted with unfamiliar documents. When subjects are presented with linguistically meaningless texts in carefully designed alternative layouts, such as this one, they quickly make specific assumptions about the likely ease of reading, the degree of factual content in, and the potential usefulness of those documents, even when they can't actually read the text. They respond to the presence of light rules and boxes in a layout as indications of seriousness. But when rules and boxes are made heavier and angled, coloured or irregularly shaped, then they become associated with sensationalism and other negative traits. <laughs> These results confirm that readers respond to the rhetorical functions of design as soon as they set eyes on a document. So, what are the mechanisms by which designers evoke reader responses? If it's not all about fonts, what is it about? If typography were only about choosing typefaces, a designer's life would be easy. We'd simply decide from day to day which particular alphabet appealed to us, and we'd use it. But typography is more than fonts. It's really about the totality of design for reading. It's a set of visual choices designed to make a written message more accessible, more easy, easily transmitted, more significant, or more attractive. Selecting the kinds of letters to use for any piece of typography is, of course, a fundamental design choice because it can have an impact on all of these aims. Some are more legible, some are designed for particular technologies, and some strike us as having intrinsic emotional associations. But let's turn to the difference between spoken and written or printed language. Spoken language is resolutely linear. When we speak, we generate a continuous stream of words which the listener decodes into words. This linearity is why the order of words in most languages is critical to meaning. We therefore recognise the significance of linear order when we listen. And when we come to write, we try to craft complete sentences whose meaning is clear from the order of their elements. Let's demonstrate this linearity. Here is part of the BBC shipping forecast for inshore waters as we listen to it on the radio. Viking. Southerly veering westerly or southwesterly five or six, occasionally seven later, slight or moderate, occasionally rough later, rain then showers, moderate or good, north utsira, southerly veering westerly or southwesterly four or five, increasing six at times, slight or moderate, rain then showers, good, occasionally poor at first, south utsira, southerly veering westerly or southwesterly four or five, increasing six at times slight or moderate, rain then showers, good, occasionally poor at first. 
Now those words, because they're not sentences, fall into a regular repeating sequence. Otherwise ordinary words, good, fair, slight, are imbued with specific calibrated meanings, far more precise than when they're used in ordinary speech. Is it this oddly patterned use of ordinary words, mostly adverbs and adjectives, read in a deliberately neutral voice with slight pauses that makes listening to the shipping forecast so mesmerising and even a calming experience for us landlubbers? Now, the inshore mariner isn't listening to be mesmerised, but to catch the name of the sea area that they're sailing in and then to extract the weather data that follows. The mariner mentally inserts the missing labels for the data that they're hearing, knowing that the order is wind, direction, speed, sea state, weather, visibility. Now those of us who are not in peril on the sea need to graphically transform the linear verbal sequence to extract the data. First, let's try setting it out line for line, like a list. Viking. Southerly veering westerly or southwesterly five or six, occasionally seven later, slight or moderate, occasionally rough later, rain then showers, moderate or good, north utsira, southerly veering westerly or southwesterly four or five, increasing six at times, slight or moderate, rain then showers, good, occasionally poor at first, south utsira, southerly veering westerly or southwesterly four or five, increasing six at times. Slight or moderate, rain then showers, good, occasionally poor at first. As we can see, this simple listing doesn't give us enough salience to the all-important sea areas, and we're still relying on the sequence to decode each piece of data. And the common alignment of the lines at the left, for example with the words seven later, causes us some ambiguity. Well, we could format the list a bit more heavily, this is better, but what we need is a presentation that will give us access to the sea area that we're interested in and puts back in those unheard data labels. Here's the same forecast, but this time it's presented as a table. Viking, southerly veering westerly or southwesterly five or six, occasionally seven later, slight or moderate, occasionally rough later, rain then showers. Moderate or good, north utsira, southerly veering westerly or southwesterly four or five, increasing six at times, slight or moderate, rain then showers, good, occasionally poor at first, south utsira, southerly veering westerly or southwesterly four or five, increasing six at times, slight or moderate, rain then showers, good, occasionally poor at first. The table demonstrates two of the advantages of visual language overspoken language, simultaneity and accessibility of information. One glance we can see the overall structure of the forecast. We can focus on the data that's specific to a single sea area by reading across a row, but unlike the list we can also compare specific conditions in different areas by reading down a column. If we were at sea the table would enable us to decide which sea area we should sail towards to find better weather. We can think of the three presentations that I've shown you of the shipping forecast as three different typographic configurations. Prose, which we'll call linear interrupted, a list, more or less heavily formatted, and finally a table, which typographers call a matrix. Just to explain this term, linear interrupted. A prose paragraph is linear, but it's interrupted by line breaks, which are arbitrary. They're not semantically significant. Line breaks and page breaks are a function of this Procrustean bed of the page, whether in print or on screen, and are determined by the maximum length of line that we can comfortably read, which is about 70 characters, and by the maximum size of the page that we can comfortably hold, or display on a screen. Now not all our spoken utterances are of equal value. Similarly, the flow of text in a document will very rarely consist of elements of exactly equal value. In speech, we use additional statements to cue our listeners to the status of what we're about to say. In written language, 
Spoken statements such as, I'll now turn to the weather, can be translated into a heading. The words following, I'll give you three examples, into an ordered list, and the words following, I heard Jane say, into a quotation. The particular sequence and combination of these elements defines the structure of a text. In visualising this structure, typographers typically use salience, that is, visual prominence achieved by spatial or contrast differences, or a combination of both. In this way, we can have a graded identification of the various elements in a text flow. The salience value that we give to any element may be determined from two standpoints, though often they'll overlap. One is a reading of a writer's intention, and the other is an assumption of the reader's requirements. So the typographer's role is to mediate between these poles. There may be external determinants on how salience is implemented, such as technical limitations, you might not have colour available, or there might be genre or house style conventions. A publisher might require that a publication has to match an existing design template or style sheet. In the 1920s, Gestalt psychology set out principles of perception that explained why many conventional typographic presentations of hierarchy work. And in doing so, they validated a lot of tacit craft knowledge. Put simply, their essential thesis was that we perceive the whole as different from the sum of the parts. We perceive relationships between elements as well as the features of individual elements. In thinking about hierarchy, the most relevant Gestalt principles are the similarity principle, which I'm demonstrating here. You can you're grouping, I'm sure, the yellow blobs into a little yellow rectangle within the big blue rectangle because you can see that they're more similar to each other than they are to the blue blobs. And there's also the proximity principle. So the first similarity tells us that we group things that resemble each other and share similar characteristics and properties. The proximity principle tells us that we perceptually group objects on the basis of their nearness to each other. Elements that are close together are perceptually grouped together, all other things being equal. And these two principles can be used separately or more powerfully together. Spatial proximity is one of the most powerful organising principles and it's therefore one of the most useful tools in typographic design. If Headings are closer to the text that follows them than they are to the text above, then the meaning and their connection to the following text will be reinforced. I said earlier that readers infer meaning and intention from layout features. So how do typographers think about layout? Layout's the arrangement of material on a page or screen that articulates the text that we're reading. Layout is a recognition that we read different parts of a document differently. The earliest form of the book supported particular kind of reading where memorising the text in order to recall it verbatim was paramount. This allowed an almost linear visual presentation with little if any spacing between words and paragraphs that was close to a continuous linear quality of speech. This was appropriate when the clergy, who were the main producers and users of books, read a small number of books at a slow pace. Major changes in manuscript production occurred in the 12th century because of the increase of the lay readership of books, and this changed the design of manuscripts. This manuscript from the 13th century is very different in appearance from a typical book of say the 9th century, which you saw earlier. The later medieval manuscript is no longer just the original work, but it includes paratextual features such as interlinear or marginal glosses, which were important for monks for whom Latin, the language of religious texts, wasn't their first language. With the development of new kinds of books, encyclopedias, anthologies and concordances, comparisons and references between texts became increasingly important 
and required solutions to help readers navigate their pages. And they used different kinds of scripts, different coloured initials, different columnar arrangements. These weren't simply a matter of decoration, they were essential to the articulation of what was becoming increasingly complex documents. And we can see a typographic sensibility in these arrangements of text on the page, despite the hand production. Glosses are often written smaller so that two lines exactly match up with a single line of the main text, establishing a modular relationship that enables pages to be planned exactly into rectangular units. Designers respond to the challenge of complex combinations of text and images by using a number of strategies. One of them is the grid. This controls the elements on a page so that Gestalt principles will link or separate them. Grids offer a way of introducing modularity and allow a page to use size, for example, both as a schematic indicator of hierarchy and also as a naturalistic indicator of scale. Imagine you're designing a catalogue of paintings. When it comes to reproducing the images, a decision has to be made about the scale of reproduction. Should the paintings be sized by importance? Well, this may mean that a picture's size is not a related to the amount of detail in it. It means that the smaller ones might be more difficult to read. Or should the pictures fit common widths or heights so that they align with horizontal and vertical intervals on the grid? Well, this is a solution that has to be adopted when pages are laid out without any specific instructions from a, from a designer. Or should they be sized in proportion to their actual dimensions so that large and small canvases are reproduced in proportion? We have to answer the question which solution best matches the needs of the reader of an individual book. Another decision taken by the designer which can be taken only in collaboration with a writer or editor, of course, is whether to treat pages simply as arbitrary divisions, much as the line breaks are arbitrary and continuous prose, or as semantic units, so that the boundary of the page, or a double page spread, or another multiple, is the boundary of the sense unit of the text. This direct visual reflection of the contents was rare in printed books until the mid-20th century, when layout ideas from magazines began to be adopted in informational and instructional books. But of course, pre-existing texts are very difficult to arrange so that the page breaks match sense units. Books which are commissioned to be read in a particular way, such as school or college textbooks, can of course be planned page by page into semantically significant units. The combination of page by page layout and a flexible grid system underlines much contemporary non-fiction illustrated publishing. Together, these concepts show how the organisation of thought in language can be represented by typographic configurations, whether we use prose, lists, tables, how hierarchical relationships within the text can be visually represented, and how the organisation of page layout, and these are at the heart of typographic design. Their common feature is that these concepts assist us in planning solutions that are rational responses to the text because they invoke the immediate, unambiguous understanding of the reader. Indeed, such choices are often initially made by writers and editors who might not consider themselves visual designers. In fact, all parties have a stake in the clarity of visual language that they produce for the reader. This emphasises the need for collaborative workflows that integrate such decisions with those who are more often seen as the typographic designer's domain, such as deciding on margins, line spacings, headings, etc., or indeed fonts. One of the advantages of print over digital media is the immediate visual organisation communicated by layout. We can see this by comparing printed newspaper pages with the equivalent story on the same newspaper's website. Web pages can offer rich media content, but they're less good at visually relating material for the reader. The printed page, this double page spread, 
organises the topic for the reader. A tint panel, that's the purple stripe, runs across the top of the two-page spread, grouping the stories underneath it. There's a large central image visualising the freeze metaphor of the main headline. Data are presented in statistical charts. A tint panel at the foot is a case set of case studies and links these together. While the smaller story on the right is a political analysis, there's even a glossary of terms in column two. The web page, by comparison, is a relatively poor affair. Only one story is presented, stripped of its statistical charts. Only the glossary remains. The connected stories have disappeared. They are elsewhere on the website, but there aren't any direct links to them. There is no image to give immediacy and appeal to the article. The items in the two right-hand columns are supposedly related, but actually most of them are generic links to other economics or politics stories, or indeed advertisements, and these are likely to have been created dynamically at the time of access. There are many more distractions and diversions for the reader on the web page than the single advertisement on the printed page. In terms of multimodality, options for readers to read in different ways, and in its ability to signal the importance of the topic and the newspaper's editorial stance, I would argue that the printed page is still much richer. Now, this disparity between media really does have to be addressed. Typography's function in organising our world of incessant information through visual form is, important, is as important as it ever was. Unfortunately, it's much more widely taught, understood and appreciated now that the tools of typographic production and design are in so many hands. The challenges for the techniques of screen-based typography to advance in areas where print is still fully functional, the challenge for print is to retain its functionality and appeal. Print isn't dead as a way of supporting focused, considered reading, but it is dying as a means of distributing information that needs to be consumed rapidly. Instead of a single print version, the Washington Post now has many variants for computers with different screen sizes, for tablets and for phones. And all of these are available globally, instantly. Each manifestation requires a modulated typographic approach that suits the publication's contents to the reader's particular needs. Maximising the efficiency of the device that they're reading it on. And yet all these versions have to be bound together by typographic branding and house style to confirm to readers that they are indeed holding the Washington Post in their hands. Printing has moved on from initially reproducing the look of manuscripts to embrace new forms. That's what it's done over the centuries. It's part of the ongoing challenge for typography as this century develops to create digital publications that rise above generic or technologically determined approaches to be genuinely at the service of the reader. Thank you.